Hi, my name is Alex Casano and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society and today we'll be having Monica Drake. She'll be speaking about the history of Heritage Village. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Monica Drake. I'm the Operations Manager for Heritage Village and I'm here to give a presentation at the Clearwater Historical Society on a tale of preservation um, at Heritage Village. Um, so, so I'll, I'll start with my first slide and somewhat of um, an introduction to why I started to take a different look at the property of Heritage Village. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of people who have done research on the buildings that are there, uh, the families that have lived there, how those buildings got there, but I think it's also um, important to understand really how did Heritage Village become Heritage Village because it's a large piece of property right in the middle of Pinellas County that is every day becoming more and more developed. So to find these big property parcels of land, um, you know, it's, it's rare, um, and w so what is the impetus for, you know, coming to this point of 21 acres, that's the size of Heritage Village, and Pinewood Park um, collectively is like 150 acres. Um, what, what really drove this kind of um, direction towards having a Heritage Park? Was it simply that one day people woke up um, and, you know, they decided we should put old buildings that were, you know, that belonged to the pioneering families smack in the middle of Pinellas County and call it a day. Um, no, that's, I'm sure there's a lot more work, you know, that went into it. And that kind of encouraged me to look a little bit more at what was really going on. So initially, um, you know, back in the 70s, um, and especially in 1976, which was the bicentennial of um, the United States becoming the United States, 200 years, um, there were a lot of movements at that time. A lot of people were organizing historical societies for the advantage of understanding the past and collecting local pieces of material culture. There were larger organizations, of course, larger museums at this time, but they really collected national pieces of importance, um, national documents, um, or regional documents. But there were very few places that had organized in localities that were really um, collecting the you know, cultural uh, patrimony of those locations. So there were quite a few people um, who were developing historical societies kind of around this bicentennial fever thinking, you know, we've got to save this stuff uh, for posterity. We've got to um, really think about how we're going to preserve some of these things because if we don't preserve them, they're largely going to end up in the landfill. We've got a lot of people from, um, you know, pioneering times. Their first generation, second generations are passing away now, um, and their kids don't want to take on all these things anymore. So where, where are we going to put these things? And... So this kind of bicentennial fever at that time um, and the emphasis on American history surrounding that bicentennial celebration um, and more specifically coupled with threats to the Plant Sumner House as well as the avail availability of the House of Seven Gables at that time propelled citizens locally here to come together and think about um, how they should organize something like that. Um, and so among those, those organizations and people here were the Bicentennial Committee of the County Commissioners. Um, they organized a subgroup to think about this very um, problem. The Pinellas County Historical Commission, which still exists to this day and is um, largely a group uh, chartered for the support and advocacy of Heritage Village. So they've been you know, doing this for 40 plus years. And then also the Junior League of Clearwater really led a lot of efforts to locate funding and resources um, for the development of a living history park. Thankfully, um, 
a roughly thir uh, roughly 30 years before the development or the opening of Heritage Village, um, a family uh, by the name of Frank and Ursula Shervis donated property um, in that kind of 120 um, acre section of where both Heritage Village and the, uh, the Botanical Gardens is now. But they, they donated it earlier than, um, uh, like I said, when Heritage Village was kind of in the works and before it opened. And so this was a bit back in time, roughly the 40s, 50s, when they donated it. And at that point, um, you know, during the war time and roughly before the post-war boom, there wasn't a lot of development going on. So the land kind of just sat fallow and, and undeveloped at that time. So when you think about kind of the trajectory of the county, it's really very impressive and kind of a bit of a kismet that this large bit of property was just sitting undeveloped and almost waiting um, for something really wonderful to be done with it. Um, Equally, um, you know, lucky it seems, um, Commissioner and Architect Don Williams designed a site plan for the original 10 acres where Heritage Village currently sits. So, um, you know, there was a bit of planning um, that went into the site. How should the buildings um, be laid out or what should be coming there? Um, and all, you know, as we know, to get those kinds of professional services done, it's a bit of money to do that. So. You know, at this time, you have a lot of people coming together. The land happened to exist. You know, it happened to be available. Um, and equally generous, the county allocated $60,000 to the development of the museum building that's on site. So um, again, just pieces of um, everyday generosity kind of um, just swirling around this project where it seems sometimes you know when you when you're trying to put a project together insurmountable you know when you look at something like Heritage Village that has 20 plus historic buildings on it now and today um, and again um, this just plot of land that wasn't developed um, almost insurmountable odds that we have it today to enjoy um, at that time the collections for Heritage Village existed in the, the Pinellas County, the original Pinellas County Courthouse. So with the original director of Heritage Village, Ken Ford, um, and the, um, the curator at that time, they had to pack up all the collections from the courthouse and move them to the new location at Heritage Village. And then at that time, the first buildings to move to the site were the Plant Sumner home, um, which was um, in peril of devastation. It had a lot of termite damage. Um, and it was sitting on a plot of land that actually belonged to a different family that wanted to um, de develop it. Um, th it was saved and moved, and then Seven Gables moved to the site. And we'll hear a little bit later again how actually quite um, remarkable uh, the, the feat of engineering and getting those two buildings to that site um, was as well. <clears throat> So I think even more interesting um, than just the bicentennial fervor that was happening in 1976 was a little bit something more than that. I think there was a, an earlier impulse towards preservation. Um, and in going through a really wonderful book um, called Visions of Eden um, by Bruce Stevenson, um, we come across uh, Mr. William Lincoln Straub, I'm sure you've all heard of Mr. W.L. Straub, a very prominent person in um, Pinellas County, uh, publisher of the St. Petersburg Times, and the writer of the, the Pinellas Declaration of Independence in 1907, which um, was you know, part of the um, process for the succession um, from Hillsborough County. And you know, if you read a little bit about Straub, um, you might hear, well, the idea of succession from Hillsborough County was so that um, people in, on this side um, of Tampa Bay could have home rule and their taxes would stay here instead of flowing um, you know, east into Hillsborough County. But I think there was a little bit more going on in Straub's mind, um, more than just home rule. And I think 
you know, part of um, kind of, again, the kismet behind this story is that there was an earlier impulse towards ecological preservation in, in the area. And this had a lot to do with, you know, the kind of um, late romantic idea of nature as beautiful and awe-inspiring and wonderful and majestic um, and grandiose um, as well as being beneficial for your health. I mean, there were a lot of people and a lot of stories that we have even, you know, um, from this area where they would come down from clogged and congested cities of the north and come down and get these really wonderful zephyrs and the ocean breeze and all of that. So Straub was one of those people. He actually, when he moved down here, he had a bron uh, bronchial infection. And... The doctors were not so certain that he was going to be okay, but he came down to this area and he recovered. And he really did, you know, point towards the fact that the wonderful atmosphere and the and the just the climate was what really helped him to be better or feel better and recover. So um, a lot of what Straub was trying to do with, um, you know, that kind of declaration of independence from Hillsborough was not only get home rule and keep taxes here, but also have the decision-making powers to um, keep some of the beautiful landscape out of the predatory real estate developers that were already coming down to the area at that time and gobbling up land and developing it without a thought. You know, some of them were not even from this area. Um, and so um, there was no zoning at that time. There was nothing like that that would say, you know, you got to plan out a city this way or you got to plan out a county this way so that it makes sense as it grows incrementally. Um, so he really, Straub, really was influenced by um, the City Beautiful movement. Um, and that was something that was happening equally in St. Petersburg. They had hired a planner named John Nolan who came to the city and was designing this really fantastic layout, almost in the style of the Frank Law Olmsteads of the, of the world. You could think of, you know, Central Park in New York, that's an Olmstead project. These really great natural spaces in the city of an urban area that are meant to be preserved for um, the use of the citizens, and that they're publicly owned, and that they are never developed. That, you know, that was his idea. And so he really wanted to create a system of parks throughout the, pe the peninsula. <clears throat> Unfortunately, <laughs> it failed. Um, the idea was somewhat accepted and um, the consummate booster that he was, he got a lot of people on board with him to believe in the idea and they thought it was a great idea, but at the end of the day, a lot of citizens and business uh, men of the day were put off by the, the thought of paying more taxes for public land. And unfortunately, um, you know, Straub's progressive vision of this being preserved in perpetuity as development happened did not occur to you other people because the idea was the businessmen and the citizens that were kind of against us and are like, we're not paying taxes um, for beautiful landscapes and manicured lands landscapes and public parks and things like that because we already live in paradise. We already live in paradise. Why would we want to put, you know, why would we want to pay taxes to put aside public lands to, when I can walk down to the ocean right now and I can see it and it's great and it's right there. Well, you know, fast forward 70 years and Straub's vision doesn't seem so unrealistic at this point in time that we're living in right now. So like I said, that worked in the 20s and the 30s. Um, you know, there was um, the, the uh, real estate boom um, between, you know, 1920 and 24. Um, in Florida, and then um, it bust, as, as we all know, um, the real estate, um, um, the housing uh, market bust. And then we went, of course, you know, the, the rest of the country bust. We went into the Great Depression, and of course, then throughout the 30s into the mid-30s, it was, um, there wasn't a lot of development 
uh, or as much happening down here at that time. And then once we go into World War II, you know, there's not a lot of development because everything's industry is really kind of all wrapped up into the war movement. You've got a lot of um, you know buildings being requisitioned by the government down here to populate soldiers and as army bases and air bases and all of that. So that all kind of stopped. But at, um, after the war, a lot of these soldiers um, who were down here training and, and whatnot, they decided they really loved it. And so after World War II, we had in this area, in, and in Pinellas County, record growth rates. Um, between 1920 and 1950, the population exploded 1,300%. 1,300%. Um, you know, and because of all of that, you have, of course, naturally problems with failing infrastructure, uh, bad sewage um, and water issues, bad roads, really rampant um, and unchecked development. Um, and coupled with the disastrous effects of infilling in places like Boca Ciega Bay, which people at that time were coming to see um, had you know destroyed the ecology there, um, were really kind of um, these almost a, a forced hand to the, the county commission to create a comprehensive land use policy. Um, and um, also, you know, um, create legislation um, that would protect some of these aquatic areas. Um, I know that, that in the legislature in the 1960s, there were movements made to protect places like Boca Ciega Bay, which at that time just was not, um, um, really doing what it needed to do as um, an estuary. It was not flushing properly and it was stagnant and all the old sea grasses were gone, um, fishing was down, and so um, it really just became kind of a wasteland that before was such a bountiful place for local residents and of course, um, you know, a, a basically a, a hatchery for things that then would grow up and go out into the sea and live a bountiful existence, hopefully. Um, that was not happening anymore. So it forced the county, like I said, to adopt the Comprehensive Land Use Plan in 1977. And as public awareness of the need to balance growth when, with environmental conservation grew, um, the county began designating more and more lands for use as park and natural habitat refugees. Um, the preservation of natural and um, ecologically sensitive spaces dovetailed at that time um, with the impulse to collect and preserve the material culture of Pinellas County, um, starting with that first slide, uh, the, the kind of bicentennial fever that happened at that time where people were like, you know, we need to really um, maintain these things for the future and for people who uh, are ancestors who want to see this in the future. Um, and so um, based, you know, with this kind of confluence of ecological preservation and um, material cultural preservation, you, you have, like I said, the, the um, commission, um, the bicentennial board through the commission, you have the Historic Commission, and then you have the Junior League coming together. You have other local citizens coming together to donate their time and money and energy. And in 1977, Heritage Village um, became a reality, opening up um, with the first two houses on site, um, the uh, Plant Sumner House, and then the House of Seven Gables followed later. But I'm gonna start a little bit of a tour with our most recently acquired house, which is the Turner Bungalow, built in 1915 in the Florida vernacular um, style. And this building is its just a gorgeous um, local example of, of the bung uh, bungalow style and ar local architecture. It was built um, in 1915 um, by Al Alfred Cleveland Turner and his wife, Amber Elizabeth Clark Turner. And they lived in this house continuously up until 1950, or I'm sorry, 2000, roughly 2014. Um, and they did not change a lot of the house. The house 
largely remain the same. They didn't do a lot of updating to the house. So um, when their daughter, Geraldine Turner, donated this house in her will to Heritage Village, um, it was just basically a time capsule of how that building looked in 1915 when it was donated, as well as um, the pieces, the, the, the pieces um, of furniture and um, photographs and um, tchotchkes and even the light fixtures in the house were all just preserved so uniquely intact. Um, thousands of objects that we, you know, have now from that particular acquisition um, and some of them you can see in the lower uh, right hand corner, um, you know, kitchen tables and china sets and dolls, um, toys, uh, all from, you know, the era spanning between 1915 and roughly 2014 when it was donated. And so, um, you know, right now we're working on a plan to restore that building and once we're done uh, with the restoration, we're going to then display those pieces as they came out of the house. Um, and hopefully it will be a time where people can come in and really experience, um, you know, the uniqueness of having those pieces come from that actual house back in the house. So that will be something really special. Here's a bit of a glimpse of the, the inside of the house now. You can see it's got a lot of really beautiful woodwork, um, um, you know, heart pine floors. Um, it has the wooden transom at the top. It's just a really gorgeous house. We're ex very excited to put it back together so that people can come in and take a look at it. And, you know, here I wanted to actually put the location of the buildings that we're going to be looking at into context for you. This is um, South, South Fort Harrison um, Ave, uh, Avenue and then Druid Road where the house existed um, back before it was moved. And you can see the lot right there is still open, but it's kind of, you know, overgrown with bushes and, and, and some oak trees now. Um, but this is kind of, you know, a glimpse into how radically um, the area changed because at this point, the house would completely not fit into that area. It is com it's a totally commercial area now. It's not residential at all. I don't know if it's zoned residential still or not, but certainly next door is like a dentist office, across the street is a shop, you know, down the street is a Publix. Um, so it really, truly, I don't know how long the house really would have survived there. It's a pretty, um, I'm sure it's, it's a plot of land that's worth quite a bit of money. Um, so you have the encroachment on these old houses and certain, you can't stop, you know, you can't stop development. It, it, it will happen, it will come. Um, but I think, you know, that's why I find there's so much beauty in these um, kind of parallel stories of cultural preservation and then ecological preservation um, kind of intertwining. So the next house that I think is important to bring up is the um, McMullen Coachman Log Cabin built in 1852. This building on property is super special because it's the oldest extant building in Pinellas County, built by Captain James Paramore McMullen um, and his wife, Elizabeth Campbell McMullen. Captain James originally came from Georgia um, down to Pinellas County for the same reason um, that W.L. Straub did, and that was because he had um, a lung infection, he had tuberculosis, and he thought perhaps that if he came down to more temperate climate, um, it would make him feel better or at least um, get rid of uh, his cough. So he did come down and they set up this, this settlement up by what is now Northeast Coachman Road and Old Coachman Road, and um, him and his wife lived there until um, 1902 when Solomon and Jesse Coachman purchased the property. Um, they operated a sawmill there, grew cotton, and it was a big citrus producing um, 
area. So if you can imagine Northeast Coachman Road and Old Coachman Road, of course, you know that there's the train tracks that go right through there. So it was a natural spot for them to um, have a citrus packing facility and ship their citrus um, out of that, that spot. And here we see <clears throat> A bit of a, a more of a close-up picture of the McMullen log cabin and then the McMullen family um, the, the McMullen brothers who came down uh, they followed James down and then um, of course the citrus packing label from the coachman's um, citrus packing venture and that's that's where it was. I'm, you know, I'm not truly sure if it was on um, the north or the south side, but you can see the train track running through there. Um, and, and of course, that would be um, a naturally good location if you were trying to um, export um, any kind of um, anything from this area out. The Plant Sumner House was built in the mid-1890s. It was the home of the supervisor for trains coming from the Clearwater City Depot to the Bellevue um, Hotel. And um, in 1912, Robert Sumner and his wife, a minister, uh, he was a minister, moved into the home with his family. He served as the postmaster, a dairy farmer, um, and lived there for some time, but um, sold it. It was then um, kind of transferred uh, ownership a few more times, but ended up with the Whitehurst family. And by the mid 1970s, it was slated to be sold um, by the owner to the concrete or the Clark Concrete property. And the Clark Con Concrete property didn't want to have the house; they just wanted to have the property. So the house at that time had really um, extensive termite damage. The new owner of the property was not interested in having the house, and so the you know Plant Sumner house at that point was really in peril of being torn down. Um, but again, a familiar organization, the Junior League, um, stepped up to save the house, and it was at this time that their advocacy for saving the house from destruction, uh, the Plant Sumner house from destruction, really kind of. Um, you know, encourage the creation of the development of Heritage Village as a place to house these really um, fantastic and beautiful examples, not only of architecture, but homes that um, so the pioneering families lived in and dwelled in and raised their families in um, for, for other people in Pinellas County and outside of Pinellas County. Um, so there you can see Robert and Julia Sumner um, in the bottom right hand corner um, and then uh, I don't know if you can see the star up here but here's the, the Biltmore um, Hotel and then the um, building, the Plant Sumner building uh, was located um, essentially where the star is just behind there and it was um, you know not uh, part of the, the hotel at all. It was really for the people, um, the, like I said, the um, person who was the supervisor of, of the rail line to um, live with him and his family. And then you, you can see an area of approximately where it was. Um, today and I think what you can probably notice from a lot of these aerials is just how built out the space is. Um, there's precious few areas where you know you can um, really see any green space. Of course you know if you, we do have like wonderful green space here but I think that's a golf course actually so. <laughs> And then last but not least, the House of Seven Gables. I think this is probably everybody's favorite house on site. I, I'm more inclined towards um, the log cabin just because it's the oldest building and I, I'm such a 21st century gal, I can't believe anyone 
ever lived in a cabin where they had to share a room with like six other people. So um, it, it's always really interesting to me to go into the log cabin and kind of imagine back, um, especially when you're having a bad day. You're, you're like, things aren't so bad. <laughs> I have running water. <laughs> um, the House of Seven Gables was built in 1907 on a bluff near present day Pinellas uh, County Courthouse. Um, so if you can imagine that, and we're so close, so I'm sure you can, it had a really beautiful um, you know, view of, of the bay. And I'm sure it just got like these just fabulous breezes off the bay. And um, the house is beautiful. So if you've never been to you know, Heritage Village, come and see it. It's, it's got like 13 rooms and it's just very opulent. Um, um, it was built by David and Mary Starr and sold in 1917, and it changed hands a, a few more times before um, being bought by the Maslich family. And between 1920-ish and 1940-ish, it was actually um, used as a boarding house. It was called the Seven Gables Inn, so it had all sorts of visitors to the property. Um, and we actually have, you know, correspondence from certain people in our collection, so that's always fun to read. Um, when you get a chance to, you can always make a research appointment with our archivist and come and take a look of, at that. Um, and then in the 1970s, again, a piece, you know, another piece of that kismet, the Williams and Walker Architects purchased that house and donated the structure for a planned historical museum that became Heritage Village. So again, we've, you know, this has come up before Don um, Williams was um, the architect who uh, had been mentioned previously, um, who was willing to kind of put together that initial plan for Heritage Village and really get that started. When they moved this building, they moved it um, from that bluff, uh, just not too far from here in Clearwater, they actually took a crane and they lifted it off the bluff onto a barge and floated it down the intracoastal to Highway 688. Then they put it on a flatbed and then they drove it to Heritage Village. So <laughs> again, you know, when you think about that, it's just, and they never, it was the whole house. They didn't bisect the house or anything. So when you think about everything that had to come together and just the insurmountable engineering feat, you know, that went into moving some of these houses, it's, um, it's really an incredible property with a lot of uh, amazing stories connected to it, such as this, more than just, you know, the history of the families that lived there, you know, the pioneering families that lived there are really important and, um, you know, it's it's well documented who lived in most of these homes, but there are these, you know, tangential stories that kind of come from these houses. It's almost like their third life where you get to learn a little bit more about um, really what went into um, some of those people in the later um, portions of the 20th century and what they had to actually do to get um, these buildings um, not only you know, get ownership of the buildings, but then also get them to the place, get the collections to the place, put the, um, you know, property together. Um, it's just really an amazing story. And then of course, I, the um, House of Seven Gables I'm thinking was probably about uh, like right here um, at that time, so you can see it had a fan, well, before the Clearwater Memorial Causeway was right there. <laughs> Probably had a very fantastic view of the bay, and if, you know, that's amazing, you know, if you're coming down to the Seven Gables Inn and you're, you know, lucky enough to spend a couple of days there, just how impressive it must be. Imagine coming from up north down on the train and this is what you encounter when you come down here. And I think that's part of you know what William Straub was really thinking about preserving. Um, uh, we have a lot of um, areas that, even today, right now, when we have a shortage shortage of housing, we have 
real estate developers and construction companies and all sorts of stuff coming into the area wondering, you know, we're all wondering what how, what building is going to go next or, you know, yeah. what, what area is going to be developed that um, should really be preserved and, and remain pristine. Um, the good news is that, <laughs> uh, you know, I working with the county has been really eye-opening for me. This is a part of the county's strategic plan, um, our current strategic plan. Um, so we, Heritage Village currently falls under the Parks and Conservation Resources Department in the county. Um, and so one of um, the major goals in the strategic, the county's strategic plan is to practice superior environmental stewardship. And I think everyone in Pinellas County should be really proud of that fact that the county has put a lot of time and effort into maintaining lands, putting money away um, to maintain lands. I know a portion you know, of the penny, penny for Pinellas goes towards saving lands. Um, so it's a, again, it's a collective effort by the citizens who, who today said, yes, I will pay a one cent tax to the penny instead of, no, we don't have to save things <laughs> like they did in the 20s. Um, and then also, um, you know, the forward thinking of some of the leadership in the county where you can see, you know, um, especially um, action 3.2 is to preserve and manage environmental lands, beaches, parks, and historical assets. So it's now converged. It's now recognized as two preservation plans together holistically um, that is an important um, piece of the puzzle. And of course, you know, with the lands at Heritage Village specifically, there is currently, um, you know, land um, designated in that large portion of property, essentially that's bounded by 119th Street, Walsingham, 125th and Almerton, that is slated to um, be deeded to the county in the future so that it can be preserved. And there's money that's been allocated to that project and earmarked so that when um, that time comes to pass, there can be um, additional lands added. And I think that's really important because as you might know, on that property, there's a watershed that runs right through there. We, it's called the McKay Creek, um, and the whole park is called Pinewood Park. Uh, Heritage Village is on the southwest corner of the park. But there are tons of natural um, um, spaces on this plot of land. There are um, you know, all sorts of birds that um, make their home here. There are all sorts of snakes that make their home here and hatch there. Um, I've seen rabbits. There are several different alligators that make their home in this creek. Um, it really is a, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I'm lucky to work right next to it because I can essentially walk out of my office and across the bridge and see a very well-preserved piece of what old Pinellas County you know, look like a little piece of the natural habitat that um, I'm so glad is being protected and preserved. So that is um, us. We are Heritage Village. We're at 11909 125th Street in Largo. Um, our uh, friends group is the Pinellas County Historical Society, and we're always looking for people who would love to join the society or help out in any way that they can. Um, you can find their website if you just do a Google for Pinellas County Historical Society. Um, and it, you can learn a lot more about um, that organization there. <clears throat> and thank you very much. It was a lot of fun to come out and talk to you a little bit about Heritage Village and some of the um, things that went into making this wonderful property. So thank you.